Hello and welcome to the Inspired Startup series of interviews with uh, startup founders. I'm joined this evening by Jason Rowe, who's the founder of Parkia, Predict, and more recently the Growth Hacker meetups in Dublin. I am really looking forward to getting into our conversation this evening. I've known Jason for, must be about 18 months now. Um, we were both on a uh, accelerator uh, in the NDRC some time back. So I'm really looking forward to uh, catching up with Jason and getting a little feel for, for where things are at. Before we get into any of the, the detail, maybe Jason, you could tell us a bit about um, Parkia, Predict Insight, and uh, the Growth Hacker meetups. Okay, so uh, Predict Insight was, was founded about three years ago. As a consultancy company, we work with large advertising agencies. We mainly help them with analytics, so uh, understanding where kind of customers are coming from, what they're doing. Um, and we also do a lot of stuff around user experience, so actually improving the overall experience that uh, customers have when they're there. Um, from that, we spun out a, a startup called Parkia. Uh, we decided we wanted to build, I guess, our own intellectual property, our own uh, kind of IP. Uh, so we went and we went through the NDRC and we went through uh, a couple of other things like New Frontiers uh, as well to, to kind of on that journey. Okay. Uh, that was about 12 months ago. Great. Um, and more recently, the Growth Hacker meetups. Yeah, so Growth Hackers kind of came out of, uh, I guess we, we kind of, we, we felt that there was an opportunity, uh, especially for, not just for marketeers, but people in the startup space who wanted to kind of grow their business. So, uh, you know, th there's a, an opening around growth hacking in that it's more around metrics-driven marketing. Yeah. So we felt that uh, if we could position it, an event that isn't just like a normal social media event yeah. or a normal marketing event, but a little bit more tech flavored yeah. uh, that you know that people would, would kind of like that. Okay. So we've done two events so far. Uh, we did our, our first event about two months ago, uh, our last event about two two or three weeks ago. Uh, we had some great speakers, great attendance. So I think we had over 190 registered uh, for the last event and we have another event coming up on the 5th of June. Yeah, I heard you had some great speakers. I couldn't make it myself now, but Niall Harbison, yeah, so uh, Marcus Siegel. And um, who was the, the third? Yeah, so we, so we had Marcus uh, Segal from Zynga, so he was ex-Zynga, so he's now Entrepreneur in Residence with the, the Summit team. Uh, and we had Niall Harbison, who was involved in a, a company called Simply's SC. He's had a couple of startups, he's a, yep. a, a yep. serial entrepreneur, uh, kind of well-known about town. Uh, and then we had uh, Karen Flanagan from HubSpot. Okay, yes, of course, yeah, uh, no, so, Karen. Yeah, so yeah. Karen's a great guy, so I'd, I'd worked with uh, Karen's younger, two younger brothers. They seem to have a bit of a... Are yeah, they all in the digital marketing yeah, space? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And they all seem to be very much, they've, they've learned from one another and stuff like that. Okay. They've worked together as well. Okay, wow. Well, different times. So yeah, that's, it's really um, interesting. It's an interesting combo, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so. Cool. Um, so I suppose maybe taking a kind of a step back and maybe going back a bit further, uh, maybe tell us a bit about yourself. You know, how did you, uh, you know, get into the internet, as they say? Yeah. Because um, it seems like there's a kind of a strong digital theme through, through the, the elements that you're involved in. So if, if we go back for, for people that'll be watching this, how did you develop an interest in this space? I guess it was kind of interesting. So I started out quite young. Uh, so I, I would have kind of had my first job working for a digital agency when I was about 15 or 16. Wow. Believe it or not. So um, where, where was that? Uh, so it was an agency called, I think at the time it was called Concept Design Group. And that was okay. back in 2000 and 2002 maybe, 2001, right. 2002, I'm still quite young. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that was that was interesting. I, I was back when design was still, you know, we were still working on CDs and, you know, okay. that, that kind of that kind of media, like, you know, uh, there's a lot of print work still. So. Right. And was that um, actual web design work you were doing or what, what form? Yeah, so it kind of transitioned. So initially I went in, I was just, I was hacking stuff on Photoshop, you know. Uh, I was the guy who was sent, you know, off to resize photos, like, you know, okay. uh, but over time, uh, I kind of, I grew with the company uh, and they took on a lot of interesting clients. Like they had a lot of bigger clients, okay. uh, a lot of government contracts um, and stuff like that. It was kind of, it was when the Celtic Tiger was still in full swing, like, you know, so uh, I thought that was, yeah, it was an interesting time to be involved in the web. Um, the company itself had transitioned more from print into web and I was kind of very much part of that transition. At the time, like there was a, at the, when I started there, there was two other developers, um, you know, and they'd been kind of involved for, for about a year or two, um, you know, doing that kind of web-based stuff. So it was still yeah. early stage, like early yeah. enough, like, you know, yeah. it was late enough that, you know, people had got the web, but they were kind of, in Ireland, I think we're still trying to work out what exactly to do with it. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, I think Ireland has always been a little bit behind. We've caught up in the last while. Mm. Have you noticed that in terms of, as we've gone along, we've, probably lagged a little bit in some of the 
I suppose general adoption of, of the internet and and certain elements within that. Yeah, like I always look at it. So when when you look at the US, I, I always kind of feel we're about four or five years behind the US, and even the UK, I always kind of think we're still a year or two behind the UK. Yeah. But still. Yeah. And we've caught up, but um, I I think that's that's down to I guess you know the the budgets that are available and the talent. Like if there's less of a budget there, you know, it's harder to get the talent to progress and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, and people are less likely to take risks. Yeah. You know, so I think that's a big part of it. Like, and, and how do you think all of that feeds into the startup ecosystem that's around at the moment? So I like so, okay. So the, the startup ecosystem for for me kind of really started kicking off around two thousand and six, two thousand and seven. That's when I started noticing it. And there were groups of people kind of getting together, and they were trying to set up co-working spaces and, and doing all this kind of stuff. And like, there was traditional business, like there was all these business networks that were there. Um, but it was different. Like it was very much like you know we're we're out to do this ourselves. You know yeah. they they tend to be a slightly younger audience or a slightly younger group of people. Um, they were willing to take risks. You know it seemed to be they didn't really care too much about the consequences, but they just went out and did it. Like you know, and a lot of those people you know have gone on to to you know found very successful startup companies. You know they're, they're like so the guys from from Intercom, you know who yeah. originally like owned McCabe and. Test all trainer, those, yeah. Test trainer, all those guys, like they, they were kind of. That was still early days for them, but I, I kind of, I remember the early days uh, when they were still kicking off. And then there's, um, yeah, I, I guess there's lots of people like that, you know, um, that were around at that time. So, yeah, I, I think that's that's kind of how that fed into it at the time. People were just willing to take risks, you know. Yeah. And they didn't care too much about the consequences, you know. Okay. Um, and how do you see that progressing now over the last? Have you seen much of a change, particularly in the last kind of couple of years? So in the last couple of years, I think it has accelerated. So what what I've generally seen is that the, there's a, there's a lot more people coming out, and you know you you kind of seen people come through this kind of ecosystem. You know, yeah. The support yeah. structure is kind of developed as well. Like you yeah. kind of see people who have you know on their second or third startup, and it might necessarily always be successful. Like you know they've just they've gone through that process two or three times. You're starting to see those people out and about and helping you know people who are just starting out. And that wasn't there at the start. Like, there was nobody there, you know, at the start. Yeah. Um, not in that way. Like, there wasn't yeah. that sense of community. It was still all still early days. Like, yeah, so, yeah. Um, I suppose it ties in with I suppose how we first got to know each other through the NDRC, mm -hmm. the accelerator. Um, and everywhere I look now, there seems to be accelerators. There, there's, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know how many there is, but I, somebody told me the seven or eight accelerators in Dublin yeah. at this stage already, and there was none. Yeah. You know, only a couple of years ago. So that's changed things quite a bit. Yeah. I think it's interesting to change. So I think the accelerators are there. They're trying to find niches within either different sectors or they're trying to position themselves like as earlier stage or later stage, different amounts or, you know, they'll take different types of equity. And I, I think that's that's interesting. Like, you know, I, I think the stronger ones will probably stay around, you know, yeah. the ones that have a bit more momentum. The only thing is, like with any kind of accelerators, I have to, like there's a life cycle. They have to go through it. A certain number of investments before they know it works and we haven't quite hit that you know hit that yet you know yeah. I think there's still there's probably another four <laughs> three or four years still in so it it's almost like they don't have enough data to know if they're doing it right exactly. or wrong exactly. <laughs> kind of thing exactly, you know? so when when they actually get the data and they analyze the numbers they might find out oh dear they, they might do like I think there's been some good wins like it depends yeah. like the NDRC seem to have done okay um, you know with a couple of the startups you know yeah. that, that have kind of really flown um, some of the other ones, though, I think it's too still too yeah. early to tell. Like you know, Wire, um, they have some great people who've gone through it, and they've had some great successes. Um, like Trustev, I think. Yeah, Trustev. Yeah, they have through there. Like you know, they're they're flying. Um, so I think there's uh, there's a couple couple like that. Um, I, I, it's hard to know where you know we'll probably see less than in the future. Yeah. And that's that's the challenge. Like maybe we'll see the more regional. Mm. You know, we're starting to see a lot of interest in Limerick and Cork. Yeah. You know, so we might see it just a spread, mm. you know, so less of a Dublin-centric focus. You know? Do you think they played a role, though, in moving things along? I, I don't know about you, but mm. well, I suppose even the events you were organizing, Growth Hackers, um, there's a lot more events on. Like, you could go mm. to events probably every night of the week if, mm. if you wanted to, yeah. um, which wasn't there. Yeah. Or if they were events, they were these real awkward business networking events mm. where people fired business cards at each other. And that sort of thing is, is not as prevalent. I, I think that's more the community though. Like I suppose if you have more people, like there's just more in the system and okay. there's more of a support structure needed. 
And I think that's probably where that kind of, like the NDRC were quite good in that sense where they, I, I think I was quite surprised that the first time I went in there, you got this big, huge calendar of all these events and all this activity that was happening across the city, you know, and it kind of opened my eyes to, you know, I knew there was a lot going on, yeah. but I, I just, I wasn't aware that there was that much, Yeah. you know, and if you went looking for it, you'd find it, no bother, but it, it was just, it was impressive to just see it there, all on, you know, yeah. on those calendars and those yeah. sheets. Like, for know. people that are watching, that are interested in the whole community that's in Dublin and in Ireland, mm -hmm. um, and I suppose probably growing across Europe, but do you have any kind of pointers or tips or... Mm -hmm. Um, do you have any kind of insights into the into the community? So, so the so so the community is interesting in Dublin. It's very. Some people say it's very clicky. So there's a bit of a click that happens, like with any group. Like you, you, you tend to you'll you'll see similar people at different events. Uh, you'll get to know each other. And um, the only real way to find more events or, or decent events to go to is by go to one, and you'll hear about three more. Yeah, you know, like what else yeah. are you going to? Oh, I'm going to this yeah. next week, or I'm going to this this week. And follow things on Twitter as well. Probably exactly. is another good yeah, one yeah, too. Yeah. yeah, just follow it on Twitter. But I always find I always found more out at the events yeah. of what was coming up, and then you'd hear about it on Twitter. Yeah, you know, and then because that's only it gets a bit of momentum or something exactly, like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's kind of like people would kind of take a risk again, like the, you know, people would at an event would kind of go, "Oh, I'm thinking about doing this thing." Yeah, I'm not really sure. Yeah. You know, it's almost a sounding board. Yeah, it's yeah. Kind of, yeah maybe. I, I kind of like that about events where there's like a spitballing approach. People are going to go, I'm thinking of doing this thing. And someone else is going, oh, I was thinking of that as well. And then yeah. next thing you hear about it, it's turned into an event or a business or something. Yeah. You know, and I, I think it's like, it's one of those things that it it has to happen. And it has to, like, people have to have those spaces yeah. to be able to put something out there. Because like, there's nothing worse. If you just choose something out there and it didn't work, everyone would just kind of go, oh, you know, that was yeah. terrible, like, a terrible yeah. idea. Or if you have a sounding board, like with the community, you're going to go, we're thinking, like, we're thinking of doing these things. Yeah. Is there any, you know, is there any merit? At okay. least you get that instant feedback. You don't have to wait to see if anyone signs up. Yeah. Or, you know, rock up to, yeah. on the day to like two people in the room yeah. kind of going, yeah. you know, hey. It's a chance to kind of bounce stuff off your peers yeah. and before you actually kind of go live with something or really push something out. Yeah. Okay. Um, and have you come across any of the, like the hacker spaces around town? Um, and what do you think of that whole movement? And um, what they're kind of doing, likes a tog and those guys. Yeah, so like uh, I'm a member of tog. Um, I've known I've known the guys that were behind it for a long time, uh, before they ever set up the space. It was interesting that like the hacker spaces kind of came out of, of of a community that was already there. So the guys that were behind tog used to meet once a month, and they used to meet up. Okay, where was that? I wasn't um, aware of that that yeah, background. Yeah, so, so it was uh, so it was there was a, a bit of a, a more traditional hacker meetup. Okay. Uh, it was called Twenty Six Hundred. Okay. Um, and it, there's, there's a magazine that's published called Twenty Six Hundred, um, and a lot of people kind of followed that. And you know, the, in the back of the magazine, there are all of these places where people meet, you know, across the world, like on particular days. Yeah. Uh, and Dublin was one of them. So people would find out about it through the magazine. They just end up meeting. I think it was outside Tower Records. You know, I used to be on the phone okay. booths outside Tower Records. Glamorous stuff. Glamorous stuff. Glamorous <laughs> stuff. And then people would go off and have, you know, they normally go for food or coffee or whatever, okay. like, and they'd sit down and have a chat, like, you know. So, like, the hacker spaces, in my mind, I, I remember back to then, like, when those yeah. were the days where, you know, you had to stand beside the phone box because nobody had a mobile. And it's kind of like, you know, how, would, how else would you contact someone to know if they were there? So, yeah. um, so I think that's where it came from. In terms of what they turned into, though, I guess there was always this, this yearning for... Uh, a physical space, you know, yeah. a place where everyone could get together, not just once a month. Yeah. And I think that's where the hacker spaces, at least in my mind, have came out of. Yeah. Um, there, there are, I suppose, there's a lot of other international hacker spaces uh, that are out there that would have kind of led the way. Um, but, you know, that's kind of where it comes out. Yeah. Um, have you tried anything? Uh, I think most of them have like 3D printers and that sort of stuff. Yeah. Have so you kind of looked at anything in that space or have you got any? So the interesting thing is with the hacker spaces, I think it's more about you bring your own idea, you bring your own yeah. project, you bring your own interests, and you try and find other people who have similar interests, maybe. Yeah. And then you can collaborate. Yeah. You, know, you can work with them, and like, so you might be a, a great designer or an artist, but you might know how to do the electronics, you know. Yeah. And you might think that you know, oh well, if I had electronics, that would make it so much better. Yeah. So you you kind of pair the two yeah. together that wouldn't normally meet. 
Yeah. I think that's what hackerspace. It's like an exchange, really, isn't it? It's exactly. you know, it's kind of you know, this is what I have, and I really love it, and you get to meld stuff together. Exactly. Um, there's a great one. I have yet to go. Um, Tog or is it Tog or T- how would they pronounce it? I, I pronounce it Tog. Tog, yeah. Tog. I'm, I'm never too sure. They have a lock picking night. They do they once do. once a week, yeah, yeah. Um, which I'd love to get to. You haven't been, have you? Have you? Have you I have, I have, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we're not supposed to say <laughs> that. We're not supposed to say that on um See, on, on, no, no, on, on camera. So I I, well, I went to an event about three or four months ago. Maybe it was before Christmas actually. And they they were doing a kind of like a I'm gonna call it a deep dive, but they had like four or five different things that they were looking at. One was like physical security, like wireless stuff, and uh, one of them was lock picking, where like I think you paid a hundred euro for the day, and it was and partly it was to help raise money for the for the, the space um, and it was actually really good because you get to try lots of different things. One of the things that I kind of got into a little bit was lockpicking. You know, I'm not very good, uh, but that's not what it's about. It's about like, you know. It's bringing people together around bringing something. Bringing people together yeah. and yeah. you can kind of work out how things work and uh, I'm, I'm a little bit more, I guess I'm technically minded in a way, so I like to understand the inner workings of things uh, and I suppose that's that's kind of your interest okay. in, in lockpicking and stuff. I've never, I've never broken into anything. <laughs> okay. There's our caveat <laughs> for everybody watching. Um, so uh, maybe to jump forward to the present, um, so your experience with Predict Insight sure. and, and Parkia, yeah. um, do you have any, uh, I suppose, insights for people that are considering, people that are watching this and going, you know, I'd love to set up a business or I'm considering taking a jump from where I'm at and, and going out on my own or, yeah. or what would be the, 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 the takeaways you would have? Okay, um, so from my own experience, I guess, um, there's a couple of things. So when we when we went out uh, and set up Predict and we set up Parkia out of the back of Predict, I'd already been doing like I'd been self-employed for a while. Like I'd been self-employed for a couple of uh, years at that stage. Um, so I kind of I learned a lot. Like I, I made a lot of mistakes along the way, and I'd already learned a lot from that. Like you know, uh, you know how to get paid. You know how to make sure that it's you know, important one. I yeah, think everybody has to go through that. Yeah, how, that how to how to try and deliver the best quality products. You know how to work with people, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Meet expectations, all that communication. Yeah. I learned yeah. a lot already, um, and I, I think that that really that served me well. Like I'd run a consultancy business or like a service business. I wouldn't even call it consultancy back then. It was just like I want a website. Here you go. Um, that's what we did. Um, but then we, I suppose, we predict. Um, it was a little bit different, so we kind of we tried to be a little bit more mature about it and say, "Well, actually, we're going to have a company. This is a, the the objective of the company. You know, we're we're going to try and work with this type of client, and we're going to try and do this type of work. So the clients happen to be advertising agencies. The type of work happened to be you know analytics and search, because uh, they were the areas that we see an opportunity in. We're talking with those clients, so we took a more structured approach to it." Uh, where the first time, like the, for the first two years, it was kind of like, uh, we're just scrambling to, <laughs> what the hell are we doing? Like, you know, uh, so I think you have to have, it's Oops. you always need that stages uh, yeah. to build it up. And yeah. um, I think that's the entrepreneurial experience though, yeah. isn't it? I think yeah. most people that I know and I've talked to, the first the first year or two was just a scramble. Everything yeah, yeah, is yeah. just like, you know, it's the ultimate firefighting exercise. I, I think so. Like, you know, I remember, I suppose the, the hardest lessons I learned the first time I went out, on my own, like I'd saved up, I'd saved up a, a decent amount uh, to to survive on, you know, to be able to to work through it, like you know, and uh, like I moved back home, I did all that kind of stuff, I cut all my costs yeah. down, and uh, like little by little, like you, you chip away at that that amount, you know, what's yeah. there, like you know, and part of me kind of feels that you know, if I didn't have that, I probably would have been better off. Now I know that's that's a very scary thought for a lot of people. Like you have to have some certainty, yeah. but I think it gives you the motivation that like if if there's no get out of jail card, like if you if you just have to go in full force, I think that's what motivates you. Like you know that's yeah. that's why you get up every day because if you don't, yeah, you know like who's going to pay yeah. the bills? Exactly. Like what's going to happen? Like you know, yeah. If you don't if you don't show up for work, yeah, what's what's going to happen? Exactly. Yeah. So I think that's sometimes people use that as a, a security blanket. So yeah, yeah. No, I think that's a very good. Um, uh, I suppose lesson uh, along the way. You mentioned a couple of things there. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Takeaways around. I know in Ireland, I've spoken to a lot of people getting paid. Mm. All those kind of things can be issues. Is there anything around that you'd have any? So, um, so I think people tend to let people take the piss yeah. in terms of payments, and um, I think you just have to agree ahead of time what the deal is. Like you know, 
that you know these are your credit terms this is this is the way you want to get paid you know make sure you have PO numbers and all that kind of stuff ahead of time understand the purchasing you know the purchasing cycle of apps app and on the client side yeah uh, and just have that all down like you know otherwise you're you're always going to run into problems yeah and there's no point in turning around to the client going you didn't pay me and I turn around well you don't have a PO yeah and you're like <laughs> But you never told me you need the PO. It's like, yeah. well, you never asked. Yeah. You know, so those kind of yeah. things you learn yeah. along the way. And so. there's only one way to learn, isn't there? It's, yeah. It's, yeah. Just, it's jumping right in, you yeah, know. It's, 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 it's kind of like, kidding. what do I need to make sure I get paid? You yeah. know, and that's yeah. that's a given. Yeah. And then if you, if there's something that you haven't done, or you know, it's just to to stand behind whatever okay. service you provide okay. and try and back it up. Okay, so continuing our talk here with Jason Rowe, we're just talking about the uh, the whole experience and the importance. Of getting to your first paid customer um, so Jason you had some insights in this whole area yeah so like I suppose I, I always class myself as a tech founder you know I'd be the kind of person to put up my hand for the more techie style problems within a company and I think the hardest part is for, for a tech founder um, is to, to go out and reach out to those customers because you don't really want to put yourself into that situation because you're, you're trying to come up with the answer to the or solution like you know so I think it's harder to you know, to to listen sometimes to what the, the other side is saying, like, you know? Yeah. So I think it's more a okay, case so you just have to get out and do it and you just have to be persistent and, you know, you just have to go out and talk with people and talk with customers. The first sale is always um, is always the toughest. Um, I guess there's a lot of trust on both sides. So it's okay. trying to be credible and trying to be trustworthy um, and make sure there's something in it for both parties. Like, you know, if there's nothing in it for you, like you, like if you're giving it to them for free, you're you're in a, you're in soft to a bad start. Yeah. You know? But if you're if there's something in it for both parties, I think it helps. So you have to highlight what they're what value they're getting uh, first off. You know. Okay. Um, and then also trying to reassure them that you're going to be around for a while. Right. If if it's a product that needs to have a bit of life, you know. Um, and you mentioned that you're I suppose a technical uh, founder. Mm-hmm. Um, would you see that as being kind of bringing a very different perspective to somebody who would have maybe more of a business background? Um, as in some of the, the sales aspects would come to them a bit easier and the technical stuff would be something that they would run away from. And would you have any insights into, you know, there's probably a lot of people out there that have got a lot of technical expertise that would be considering founding something but would go, well, I don't have those skills. Yeah. So would you think just learn them, partner with somebody that has them, what would be the, I mean, the best way to do that? I, I think it depends on the type of person you are. Um, if, if you want to challenge and you want to push yourself, learning those things can be quite rewarding. Um, partnering with someone can also be a, you know, very you know, beneficial for both sides. Um, you know, if someone who's out there every day, as used to kind of, you know, used to the hustle. Yeah. You know, schmoozing. Yeah, for want of better words. Get into it straight away. Put a customer at ease. Get a decision made. Um, so that comes naturally to some people. Um, I, I don't. When I say naturally, I think it just it takes time. You know, and you have to do it. And you know, build it up over time before you be able to, to hustle that way. Yeah. You know, I think anyone can learn, uh, but I think if you're if you're looking to get an immediate sale, or you're looking to get something over the line quickly, bring someone in with expertise, learn from them. Yeah. You know, if you can, and uh, and you know, build a relationship that way, like you know, okay. or, or just you know, or just have a very good partnership. Yeah. You, know? you mentioned an important thing there. It is about building relationships. Yeah. As much as sales, you know, yeah. people over here see sales in a very in Ireland, I should say, as a very um, a kind of one-dimensional process, where really it is, it's relationships, it's people, yeah, yeah. you know, and that's something you know you experience and you really find out when you when you run a business. I, I think the the people first kind of aspect is, is of sales is definitely is like something that's always stood to me. Like if you can build a really genuine relationship with someone, and actually like you know to the point where you actually care, you know, about yeah. them. As in, like if you've seen them on the streets and they were in distress you'd want to help them or you, yeah. you'd want to do something I think you have to build up you know a certain amount of that relationship with, yeah. with someone and it's not just another business like yeah. you know it's not like you're you're just dealing with a supplier yeah. you know and you know supplier supplier uh, you yeah. know we delivered it done you know yeah. it has to be something meaningful and yeah the, the other thing I learned very early on I had a couple of clients uh, who were actually very good at, at giving giving you business you know yeah you know, so they'd actively go out and try and find people they know to, to you know, to push business to you. Like, you know, yeah. obviously they want you to stay around. Like, they want to make yeah. sure that you can continue doing yeah. that. But in the same way, I try and do that now too. 
Yeah. Like, you know, if I'm selling something to someone, I'm also trying to give them business. Yeah. And build that relationship that way because, and it's so important. Like, if you can, you know, just give something yeah. like that. Something that two extra, way lasts. Something one yeah. way is always very fleeting. Exactly. You know, yeah. and like if you can, if you've done it a few times it tends to come back around, yeah. you know? So. The great big karmic wheel of, of business. It's true, and if they don't, you just you burn them. <laughs> Set fire to the bridge. <laughs> you know. we see you again. Don't um, burn them, don't burn <laughs> yeah, yeah. them. It's not, not a business strategy to be recommended. Um, one of the things uh, I actually wanted to mention, I know you've been heavily involved with the IIA, the Irish Internet Association, and um, I know Joan Mulvihill, give her a shout out, uh, great, uh, great girl. Um, what, how, would, how was your? How did you end up uh, being involved with the IAA actually, and how did that? Okay, so so that was that's a funny story. Um, so my involvement with the IAA was I I'd gone out on my own, and for the first time, uh, and I'd I'd kind of stirred up a big hornet's nest of publicity. Um, if you go onto my blog jasonrow.me, you'll see what that was about. But I basically I I I, I got caught up in this situation with a, a national airline where I kind of I dissed them a bit and they dissed me a bit and we kind of had a bit of a public spat but after that I, I was trying to you know rebuild my you know rebuild my kind of uh, I guess my not my persona but I profile was to, I suppose maybe is that the word yeah really important if you're in business because your, yeah. your, your profile is is very closely linked to your business yeah. and, and what you're doing and stuff so and around the same time I got involved in a lot of community activity like I was involved in bar camps and biz camps uh, I ran meetups I did all this kind of stuff and around that time I found that all these people were a part of the Irish Internet Association like a lot of them were okay. involved so I was like what is this thing and then I kind of I tried to get involved with the IA at an early stage and I found it I didn't find it very welcoming at the, at the time so I decided, you know, I wanted to change that. Yeah. And the most obvious way to change that was to get involved. Okay. So I it's a good approach, actually. Yeah. yeah so people I'm, often don't do that. People yeah. often sit back and, and, and moan, but like that's a good way to do it. Yeah, just get so in and see about. Just get in. Be and the change. Yeah, be yeah. the change and spur it on. So I, I wasn't a member at the time, but I decided I'd sign up for membership, and I put myself for the board election. You good know? man. And I was like, well, we'll see what happens. Like you know, if if nothing else, you know we'll see what happens so I put myself onto the board uh, or put myself up for election I put this manifesto together of like these are my objectives of things you know I want to do and nobody had ever done that before seeing me so okay. you know what I actually said I want to achieve these things you know uh, by, by being involved um, and that went down really well so yeah. you know the membership responded and it's a, it's a voting process so people have to vote you in and uh, I see me I got it you know voted on so uh, I've been on the board for the last five years now. Okay. Um, I've moved. Uh, I think the organisation has moved on, uh, and the people who are involved have changed. And I think it's a very, it's a very different association to what it was when I'm, you know when I started out. Um, I think some of those changes, I've helped, you know, to to encourage those. And um, we've a new, you know, Joan was only a new CEO when yep. I was coming in. Like there was a different CEO at the time, so there was a lot of change. Um, and she's done a she's done a stellar job, like, you know, over yeah. the years. Uh, I'm now the uh, the vice chair okay. on the board. So as of uh, as of the last board meeting, um, so I'm trying to keep up my commitment to, okay. to that, so I'm just trying to give something back to the industry as well. Okay. So. And um, on the growth hacker meetups, they seem to be getting a real good momentum and. Seems to be a nice crossover of people from marketing and kind of product and yeah. you know uh, the whole kind of development world. Where, where are you guys planning on taking that? Do you have? It seems like something with a lot of potential. Yeah. So, uh, so it was a collaboration between myself and a guy called James Kennedy. He runs a site called Pie Hole uh, TV, uh, which is a great name. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, a great, brilliant name. name. It's a great name. Just a plug. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so, so we we were kind of talking. I was thinking about doing an event, and I kind of mentioned it to James. I kind of said, you know. Thinking about doing this thing, like like we said earlier about the events, yeah. And you say it to someone, they bounce it off. So yeah. they go, well, I was kind of thinking of doing this thing, and it kind of there was a bit of a crossover there. So we kind of said, okay, we'll collaborate on it and we'll promote it together, and that's how it started. Um, so the first event we ran was pretty ad hoc. It was like we had three weeks before the event. I think I rang you and yes. I rang a few other people. Yeah. I was like, oh, I've got all these speakers, like you know, and uh, and James said, okay. You know, okay, let's let's give this a go, like you know, and uh, so we did the first event. We only had space for about sixty people. Uh, we took on we took on way too many registrations. It was like one hundred and thirty 
and we didn't really know like it was a free event the first one so we're like we're not sure how many people will show up so we said okay we'll, we'll just we'll just go with it like, yeah you know? and we were lucky enough we, we had a full house like we, we had maximum capacity or whatever we did have to turn people away though so that was the first yeah. lesson we learned it's you know, not the worst complaint in the world. It's not the worst complaint, but obviously you they'll be hungry. They'll, they'll sign up <laughs> earlier next time. Exactly, yeah. you don't piss people off though as well. Like, yeah. You have to, you have to appreciate that people are coming out to see things. And the second one we did was um, was interesting. Again, we, we focused on the speakers and the content. We said we're gonna we're gonna try and get the best speakers we can get. Yeah. You know, um, I got I got a bit of a tap on the shoulder uh, from from a guy called Paddy Cosgrave, uh, who runs the Web Summit, and and Paddy actually gave me a bit of a nudge because we were gonna do it a little bit later. Yeah. So we were going to push it out another week or two, uh, and Paddy mentioned that there was, you know, Marcus wasn't there, yes, yeah. you know, and that would we be interested, and I was kind of going, well, that's awesome, like, you know, that's great, he's a good speaker, Yeah. Um. Uh, so we, we got, you know, some other speakers who were, you know, on par, you know, as yeah. well, you know, because you, you have to have a good kind of... Base, of, I suppose, for want of a better yeah, word, yeah. Exactly, yeah. and that was a big draw, so we, we that worked really well. Um, we, we signed up, I think it was a 190 or something like that, um, and we had, I think it was 140 on the night, okay. uh, something like that. So um, that was a paid event, so it was the first event that we kind of we charged for. That was a bit of a risk we took, because we were like, you know, will people actually pay for this? Yeah. You know, the first event, it was like... It's the real test of a business model, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it really kinda, is. You're like, will they actually pay for it? Because the first event, we'd put our own money down. So we'd sponsored like the venue, the pizzas, the beer... We paid out our own money and we're like, we have no idea if this is going to work, but we'll give it a go. And then the second event was much, I guess, you know, a lot of the tickets covered most of the costs. Yeah. You know, so we still had to put money down, we still had to pay a little bit, but at least you can kind of go, well, you don't mind putting it on, <coughs> like, you know, uh, because of that. Um, it looks like the third event, so we have another event coming up on the 5th of June. Uh, and with a plug. Yeah, a little plug. Uh, so the the details are still to be announced. So um, okay. we'll we'll have all the details up there. Can you tell us about any of the speakers? Can you give us any? This um, is all top secret. It's, it's still all top secret okay. at the moment. Watch this space, folks. <laughs> yeah, watch the space. Keep, keep an if eye you on go this to one. Um, we we picked up a domain. The, the other feedback we got was we were doing all these kind of Tito registration pages and meetup.com. dot com. Yeah. Um, so if you go to to hackinggrowth uh, you'll you'll find all the details there. So. Okay. Uh, you'll be able to find the registration. All okay, stuff. good so stuff. It's a paid event, so, you know. Okay, you're right. Get, get, your ticket get out your checkbooks, folks. <laughs> yeah. um, so, I suppose just to wrap it up then, where do you see the whole, so there's, we talked about, I suppose, the startup ecosystem, the community, your own experience. Um, for people that are watching this, do you have any kind of suggestions in what industries are really going to take off, what areas there's growth, you know, people talk about Bitcoin, the Internet of Things, and sure. people are still, you know, Developing really interesting software products and, and websites. What's what's you know what, what's the, the areas to look at? Okay, um, so like uh, I'm so Bitcoin's interesting, but I'm always a little bit reluctant uh, because of anything with legislation where there's payments or any of that stuff is always a bit scary. So I think there's interesting things that will happen there, but I think it'll be different or it might change. And the Internet of Things, I think, is is very interesting. So the idea of all these devices that are, are potentially connected. Or you know your smartphone is able to identify different devices and react, or respond. It's an area that we've kind of within Parkia we focused on very early on, which was was around uh, Bluetooth Low Energy, so iBeacons, okay. BLE, uh, four. I think there's a huge amount of potential in that uh, that particular space. I think it's still in its infancy. Like I think Apple only announced it at the end of last year as, as a feature. Uh, it's rolled out on from the iPhone 4S up. Yeah. Um, so the idea of being able to do like things like indoor mapping. Or be able to trigger events in physical spaces, I think is very exciting. Yeah, uh, especially in terms of retail, uh, especially in terms of you know trying to capture demographics. You know, I think the data side is is where the Internet of Things will excel. Right. You know, trying to you know mine that information is probably you know is probably right. where it's going to go. Kind of getting into like in store analytics, that sort of stuff, really getting into. Kind of depth as to what's going on. Without it being creepy. Like, yeah. Without it being creepy. Like, <laughs> that I is think, an important Like You're starting to see things like, like MasterCard and all those guys that are doing all these programs where they're trying to encourage people to, to sign up to these programs. I think it would be things like that. You know, where it's, you know, O2 do it as well with O2 Treats, where the consumer, you know, opts into a service, you know, that they get some value from it, but at the same time, it's a, it's a mutually beneficial arrangement. Like, you know, I think we'll see more of that, but I think we'll see it more... Uh, both on, on smartphones and devices, um, and that's what makes it less creepy, I think. Okay. I, that's that's what I'd 
kind of feeling. Okay, good yeah. stuff. Yeah. So for people that would like to hear more about um, uh, the Parkia app, um, Predict Insight, and Growth Hackers, maybe you could just give a quick plug to each of those. Where yeah, where can they find out more? So if you want to check out Parkia, uh, Parkia is a, a product that helps people find on-street parking around cities and make payments. Go to parkia.com, so it's P-A-R-K-Y-A.com. Uh, for Predict Insight, uh, you can go to our website, predict.ie. Uh, and for Growth Hackers, you can check out uh, hackinggrowth.me. Okay, so that's our uh, talk for this evening. Um, hope you'll join us uh, for uh, the uh, some of our up-and-coming uh, sessions uh, with further uh, founders. Thank you. Thank you.